It's that time of year again when the city sends out semi-threatening letters reminding you to pay your arts tax. Now, if you forgot, back in 2012, we all voted overwhelmingly in favor of this tax, uh, which supplements arts education in public schools and funds art programming in our city. But the moment it passed, (laughs) it just seemed that most of us regretted our decision. I mean, even larger arts organizations that petitioned for it claim they saw less money than before the tax was passed. So today on CityCast Portland, we're talking with Helen Del Toso, Director of Grants for the Regional Arts and Culture Council, or RAC. RAC is one of the main organizations that help distribute some of the funding from this yearly $35 arts tax. Now, Helen is here to explain how this all works and why this tax is still beneficial to our city. It's Monday, April 3rd. I'm Claudia Meza, and this is what Portland's talking about. Helen, thank you so much for making the time. I know this is kind of a little bit of a controversial subject, so I really appreciate your candidness and your expertise in the area of this arts tax. Ever since it passed, there's been some grumbling about it. And, you know, obviously not just by the citizenry, but by the largest arts organizations in town. We're talking like Portland Art Museum, Oregon Symphony, Portland Center Stage. They've actually claimed that they're seeing less after the arts tax was initiated. Why do you think that is? Well, first of all, I really appreciate you inviting me to be part of this conversation I'd love to take just a minute to talk about how the money flows, because I do think that that's something that your listeners should understand, um, that the tax is collected by the Revenue Bureau of the City of Portland. And um, some of the money, I think it's somewhere between 10 and 12 percent, goes to them to actually collect the tax. So like admin costs? Exactly. And in the beginning, they could only take up to 5 percent. And that's where the real struggles began insofar as we weren't really able to get the kind of income flowing in that was promised. So I think that's where some of the initial frustrations came from. When City Council gave the Revenue Bureau the green light to um, add a little bit of money in so that they could do a much more thorough job, we've actually seen a lot more of that money uh, flowing in. And I think right now, I've seen statistics that say as high as 75% of the mm-hmm. those who should be paying the tax are paying the tax, and that's phenomenal. Then the mm-hmm. other piece of the pie that I think a lot of people know about, but maybe aren't clear, that the next group of folks that receive the funding are the six school districts that have schools within the city of Portland city limits. So this means that um, they take some of this money Maybe about 70%, um, just a minus, goes to the school districts. And I'm going to pause you there for a sec just to explain. For those who don't know, when they were uh, trying to lobby for this tax, a lot of us voted yes overwhelmingly because it was supposed to mainly go to education. And there were just so many art programs that were cut in school. So we're just like, yeah, for 35 bucks, if public schools get more arts education, awesome. So that's good to hear that that's happening, you know. With that in mind, that's just... The setup is, is that RAC doesn't get all the money. That's my Mm -hmm. only point. And the money we do receive, for us, the timing of the tax coincides with RAC beginning to do a more concerted effort at equity work. So as the, the fund began to build, it became clear to us that there were a lot of organizations that we're not getting access to this money and that their constituencies and audiences and community members that they are serving also then might not have access to Mm -hmm. this money. So the idea being, Claudia, if everybody is paying into it, how can RAC support this idea that anybody in any community has a chance of being able to access art near them and not necessarily have to come downtown or go someplace else to have access to art. 
particularly in our fabulous system of neighborhoods and communities where a lot of arts organizations are and a lot of cultural organizations and entities that are representative and led by people from very specific racial communities, from the disability community. This is what we saw as potentially being something that we could do with Mm -hmm. these tax funds. And it made a lot of sense. Um, Yeah. And it made a lot of sense to the folks in City Hall at the time uh, that we were trying to figure out what's the right way to put this money out there. So basically what you're saying, I'm just going to recap, is that our taxes is given to, you know, the revenue service of the city. And they then take a little bit from it so they can pay themselves to continue going after people who are not paying the arts tax and uh, and also <laughs> processing the funds. <laughs> and then a huge chunk goes to the schools, which is what we all agreed was going to happen. Correct. And then uh, RAC gets a bit to distribute amongst other organizations. And what you have all decided is like, hey, we're not just going to give to the big five. And that's what we call, you know, PAM, Oregon Symphony, Portland Center Stage, you know, the ballet. Uh, yada yada. Instead, what we're going to do is we're going to look at Portland as a as a larger community and go, okay, well, East Portland, what are you supporting? Okay, North Portland, what's going on? So that money is is maybe just just being distributed a little differently, and maybe that's what the Big Five are seeing less of. Is that am I, am I making that up? Am I making that up? Because that's what I'm, I'm I'm picking up. I don't know. I, I don't think you're making that up, and I don't want to speak for them. Of I, course, I yes. do know that it takes a lot to run the organizations that are the size of the organizations that you mention. And the work they are doing, the resources they are sharing with community, these things are amazing. And we are so fortunate to have that kind of work happening in our community. And we've got to give access, right? Gotcha. Yeah. And I wanted to ask, uh, how does RAC work with the city to disperse funds to Portland's art community? You kind of touched upon about how you do that with the arts tax funds, but that's not the only money that's coming through uh, RAC. And I also find it really interesting, like your connection with the city. So RAC is a private nonprofit. We came into existence through something called an intergovernmental agreement that exists between the city of Portland and the Tri-Counties and Metro that -hmm. agreed that a nonprofit private arts council was a more strategic way of serving the arts in the region. And I could not agree more with that. We can function We can move really quickly in terms of paying folks. We have processes, but they're not as onerous as I think what we see with with, in government. Um, As well, we as we can privately fundraise, right? Um, And we work in direct connection with Commissioner Ryan's office, who has oversight of the arts. And we also work probably more closely with the City Arts Program, which was developed a few years ago as part of an audit that was done to support the city in thinking about what are the city's goals for the arts? What kind of a city does Portland want to be in relationship to its artists and arts organizations? Yeah, it makes sense. And when you said interagency, you just mean because it's county and city. Right on. Yes. Right. That's cool. correct. So, you know, there is a misconception that RAC f- then funds most of the public art because they see you oh. guys as the funnel. I mean, what do you say to that? Do, you know, <laughs> if, if someone if someone had a complaint about, let's say, you know, the uh, Cunic looking glass lamp sculptures downtown, where should they file that complaint? That's really a great question. So <laughs> public art is separately funded through something called the Percent for Art programs. And there's a So not the arts tax, not the arts tax. No, arts tax doesn't go into the public sculpture or statuary or monuments or anything like that. It doesn't clean graffiti. The public art is a 2% ordinance in the city of Portland. And I believe it is the same in Multnomah County. And we have team members that work at 
RAC, the Regional Arts and Culture Council, who manage public art processes. And they do so with the bureaus or community jurisdictions where the public art is going to be placed. And usually this is funding that comes off of the building of a new park or if a park is going to be changed in any way and there's construction associated with that. Mm -hmm. One of the ways that that 2% or that extra funding can be spent is in public art. And the public art, for example, TriMet and the Port mm-hmm. of Portland, which manage So they're the ones who take care of that TriMet and Port of Portland? But they have their own public art programs. It just seems like such a Portland thing where you can't figure out which office to go to to do the thing you need to do. But you know, you know? what? I, I appreciate you saying that. But I also want to say with respect to public art, it is brilliant that we have other entities that value art enough to want to integrate it in gotcha. at the point of change, right? Mm-hmm. We're going to be building these new aspects of our library system. We're going to be building these new aspects of our light rail. Let's bring artists on and let's integrate art so that the experience for the users is off the charts, right? right? If you're going to this park or riding on this max train, be surrounded by beauty if you can, right? And more people at the table can often generate more and interesting ideas. Like if it was all isolated in one spot, you might be seeing a lot of repetitive work being done and commissioned and you don't because there are a lot of players who believe in the power of art in the public space. So what I'm hearing is there's no centralized location. I would say that if it's related to the city of Portland and it is somehow governed by the city of Portland, then RAC will be the team of folks who will be supporting the design process for how the public art is selected. So you're the curators in a sense, like helping curate. I would say they're kind of like program managers or project managers, right? Okay. The effort is not to place something in a community that members of that community have not participated in the Mm -hmm. genesis of that project. So knowing all this, who do I go to write a uh, firmly worded letter about the baby face at Providence Park and the glass sculptures? Uh, in in Southwest. So what I'm hearing, to, <laughs> what what I'm hearing, Claudia, is those are not your favorite <laughs> the ba- sculptures. A baby face at a soccer pitch. I don't understand. I just I wish I just I saw the connection. You know, like here's a a, a like a laughing baby, kind of scary. Mm-hmm. I don't, I mean, whatever. I'm 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 taking the conversation, but I'm just wondering, you know. know. I'm going to be super diplomatic about this. Not all public works, not Mm -hmm. all performances, not all art works for all people. If it's helped you have a conversation with a friend or a neighbor or a colleague about how (laughs) how crappy you think that art is, then it has maybe done its job and also offline. I will give you the information you desire. Thank you. (laughs) (laughs) Expect a letter, someone. All right, let's take a break here. When we come back, should we just stop paying our arts tax? So you've been working in the nonprofit art community Uh, like way, way before the arts tax was even brought about, uh, from where you're standing, what benefits has the arts tax brought to the Portland arts community? What do we have to show for it? So let me just give you a few statistics. Since 2016, over 20 new organizations have been able to see receive RAC general operating support. 2016 for me is when we really started to see uh, the money coming in in a way that we could open up our processes to more organizations. These are organizations that serve 
very different communities. Last year, we took in both street books and Friends of Noise. Um, Oh, cool. For those who don't know, Friends of Noise is uh, an organization that is really actively trying to find all ages spaces for uh, the youth in Portland, because there's not many all, all ages music venues. So that's awesome. They also train young people in sound design and set design for music shows, right? Mm -hmm. So they are allowing young people not only to have a stage to produce their own work, but also to learn the skills Mm -hmm. that perhaps could could get them some pay. And that's coming from the arts tax. That's right. We were able to take them in because RAC has more money to give. The other thing we were Mm -hmm. able to do is to start a capacity building program. And there are 14 organizations that have been served through this particular program. And the key to receiving RAC capacity building is that you are led by and serving a majority underserved or historically underserved organization by the Regional Arts and Culture Council. So this includes Um, primarily organizations who are led and serving BIPOC community and whose artists that are presenting the work are Black, Indigenous, and artists of color, as well as organizations in that are led and serving the disability community, such as Sima Space. Is that the, uh, for deaf, uh, hard of hearing? That place is amazing. It blew my mind when I heard about them. You know, all their suggestions that they're like, hey, if you have a venue, how cool would it be if you had something that vibrated so people who are deaf can feel the music? And I was just like, yeah, that sounds amazing. So that organization, and then another organization outside the frame, um, which does filmmaking with houseless and homeless youth. These are organizations that were able to receive some capacity building support. Capacity building support allows for an organization to receive a little bit of general operating dollars and some professional development for their team that's leading the work in Mm -hmm. order to grow with intention their organization and make sure that they're meeting their mission. So these are things that weren't happening pre-arts tax and allowed the Regional Arts and Culture Council to continue to move and and feed other communities mm-hmm. um, that weren't frankly being being fed by the traditional more traditional arts organizations that we are serving through general operating support. So that's where the arts tax dollars are going. That's where some of the arts tax dollars are going. Before we go, like what should people go or see or do right now that is art tax funded. For those who are just like still a little sore about the $35 a month, which by the way, I'm not speaking lightly of, even I, <laughs> who benefited greatly from the arts community, is every every year I'm just like, again, you know, but what should people go to, to feel like they're getting a bang for their buck? That's a great <laughs> question. So I would suggest any of our theater companies, uh, many theater companies, particularly Profile Theater, Red Door Project. These are organizations that are in conversation constantly with community about the stories that are being told and are working really hard to make sure that these stories are being told by the folks whose stories they belong to, right? Uh, Another thing, you want comedy? Comedy in the park. Last year, we supported Kickstand Comedy in Laurelhurst Park. Oh, Uh, you guys are behind that? Wait, that's that's our arts tax dollars at work? That's your arts tax dollars at work, okay? People love that series. I love that series. Okay, well, okay, we're done. Sold. (laughs) Pay your arts tax, people. (laughs) You want stand-up comedy in the summer while you're sneaking in a beer? Pay your arts tax. (laughs) Well, Helen, thank you so much for taking the time and and the the energy to explain all of this to us. (laughs) Thank you. (laughs) And now for your microdose of news. There's a debate over the future of a downtown block, or O'Brien Square, that once earned the nickname Paranoid Park. Uh, Think heavy drug use. 
Now, this space is going to reopen for the first time in five years since the city fenced it off to make structural repairs to an underground garage. Ideas for what to do with the area, the Oregonian reports, include transitional housing, food carts, a public garden. Now, I propose we just make O'Brien Square an actual park that's, you know, not paranoid with food carts and a smaller covered skate facility. Like, who doesn't love a functional green space? And that is something downtown is sorely lacking. And a famous Portland house in the Irvington neighborhood is for sale. It's a $3 million home in the style of the White House that was built as a summer home in 1911 for a lumber baron. Now, Portland's White House is about a fifth the size of the D.C. original, but it still has nine bedrooms, each with its own bathroom. Now, this brings to mind a favorite Little Wayne lyric of mine from his 2009 hit, Steady Mobbin', where he states, Big house, long hallways. Got 10 bathrooms I could, you know, all day. And you too can, you know, all day for $3 million. For even more local news and events, sign up for our daily newsletter, Hey Portland. We'll throw a link in the show notes. That's all for today here on CityCast Portland. If you're enjoying what we're doing, could you take a moment and just like rate or write a nice review on your podcast app? Uh, And a big thank you to all of you who have already done so. I can't explain how much joy it brings us to read nice words about the show. The entire Portland team is working really hard to keep this going daily, so we really appreciate it. We'll be back tomorrow morning with more from around the city. Until then, see you at Slim's. Slim's.